Welcome to this presentation on jugular venous pressure. In this session, we will explore its anatomical basis, the measurement techniques, waveform interpretation, and, a, and their clinical significance. Jugular venous pressure is an indirect mark of the right atrial pressure. It reflects the central venous pressure and is best assessed using the internal jugular vein due to its direct anatomical continuity with the superior vena cava in the right atrium. An elevated jugular venous pressure suggests a right-sided heart pathology, while a decreased jugular venous pressure may point to hypovolemia or hypovolemic shock. Clinically, the jugular venous pressure helps to assess volume status and the right heart function. And you need to remember that the normal jugular venous pressure is less than 3 or 4 cm above the sternal angle. An understanding of the neck vein anatomy is a key to JVP assessment. The right internal jugular vein is ideal as it drains directly into the superior vena cava without intervening valves. In contrast, the external jugular vein, although more visible, is less reliable due to its indirect drainage and the presence of valves. The left internal jugular vein is less preferred due to its anatomical compression by the thoracic structures, and notably, the internal jugular vein lies medial to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, while the external jugular vein is superficial. To examine the jugular venous pressure, you need to ensure the patient is relaxed, raise the bed so that you are not straining, position the neck of the patient until you have the best view. Make your first goal to just be able to see the pulsation and then decide if it's an arterial or a venous pulsation. If you cannot determine the jugular venous pressure, report that the exam is JVP not visualized rather than reporting that there's no JVP, which basically implies that JVP was not visualized and is not elevated. And then after that, you need to measure the jugular venous pressure. To measure the jugular venous pressure, you need to locate the top of the venous pulsation, extend a ruler horizontally from that point, and another one vertically from the sternal angle or the angle of Lewis. Add 5 cm to the approximate height at your pressure. For example, a pulsation at 8 cm above the sternal angle corresponds to a jugular venous pressure of 13, that is after adding 5 to the 8. A jugular venous pressure waveform comprises of three positive waves, the A, C, and V waves, and then two descents, what we call the X and Y. An A wave occurs just before the first heart sound or the carotid pulse, and a V wave just happens after that. When the heart rate is 80 or less, they are very easy to time, but if the heart rate is faster, then you may need to auscultate while you observe. Let's proceed and break down each component of the jugular venous pressure waveform. An A wave marks an atrial contraction and is absent in atrial fibrillation. A C wave represents a bulging of the tricuspid valve during the early ventricular contraction and this type of wave is typically not visible. An X descent reflects an atrial relaxation. The V wave marks the venous filling during late systole. And a Y descent marks a ventricular filling, or what we call the opening of the tricuspid valve allowing the ventricles to fill. What are some of the clinical indications for jugular venous pressure assessment. A jugular venous pressure assessment is crucial in evaluating conditions such as right heart failure, a cardiac tamponade, tricuspid diseases, intravascular volume status, and a pulmonary hypertension.
To distinguish between the jugular venous pressure and carotid pulsation, we use a mnemonic police. Police stands for palpable, occlusion, location, inspiration, a contour, and an erection. For jugular venous pressure, we are not able to palpate. However, we can palpate a carotid pulse. The occlusion in jugular venous pressure disappears but persists in a carotid pulse. The location of the jugular venous pressure is lateral to the carotid behind the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the location of the carotid pulse is medial. Then during inspiration, the jugular venous pressure decreases however there is no any change in the carotid pulse. Then the contour is biphasic in jugular venous pressure and has a single bit in the carotid pulse. And lastly, the position or the erection reduces with sitting and increases with supine, that is for the jugular venous pressure, and there's no any significant change in the carotid pulse. Let's proceed to abnormal jugular venous pressure waves. The first one is an elevated A wave. An elevated A wave indicates an increased resistance to the right atrium emptying, often due to an obstruction at or beyond the tricuspid valve. The common causes will include pulmonary hypertension, rheumatic tricuspid stenosis, or a right atrial mass, or a thrombus. The next abnormal wave is a canon A wave, where a canon wave is a prominent, large, venous pulse occurring when the atrium contracts against a closed tricuspid valve. It is characteristic of an atrioventricular dissociation, such as an incomplete heart block, or a ventricular tachycardia, as well as a premature atrial junction of beats. Then we have an absent A wave, which is a hallmark of atrial fibrillation. Because there is no any coordinated atrial contraction, an atrial contribution to the venous pulse disappears. We then have an elevated V wave which suggests a tricuspid digestation. During ventricular systole, if the tricuspid valve is incompetent, blood digestates back into the right atrium, producing a prominent V-wave known as the Lanzisi sign. This may be accompanied by a pulsatile liver and a pan-systolic mama which intensifies with inspiration. Then other signs related to the jugular venous pressure are a cusmal, sign and a Frederick sign. A Cosmo sign is when a jugular venous pressure rises on inspiration and this is often seen in pericardial tamponade or a right heart failure. A Frederick sign is an exaggerated X wave or a diastolic collapse of the neck veins from constrictive pericarditis. All of these signs provide a clinical insight and should always be interpreted in the broader clinical context of the patient.